Our next session is on the theme of resource potential. That is, how can we use the data and insights we have gained into the geology of Australia and processes which concentrate resources to inform exploration or resource management. Our first speaker is Dr. Ariane Ford, who will talk about assessing mineral potential to narrow the exploration search space. Ariane is the activity leader for mineral prospectivity and prediction and module leader for national mineral potential mapping in the Exploring for the Future program. She holds a Bachelor of Science with honours in Computer Science and a PhD in Economic Geology, both from James Cook University. Ariane joined Geoscience Australia in January 2022 after more than a decade in academia and a short stint in industry. Her experience is in the analysis and integration of multidisciplinary geoscience data for assessing mineral potential. Welcome everyone. Today I'm going to present work going on in the Exploring for the Future program that helps support understanding Australia's mineral potential in order to narrow the exploration search space and to deliver value-added pre-competitive geoscience data. This sort of work is not an individual effort and relies on a diverse team to deliver impactful results. So I'd like to thank everyone who has contributed to the work I'm presenting today. Mapping mineral potential is a multi-stage process that involves input from across the Exploring for the Future program in terms of both data and expertise. In this presentation, I'll be highlighting some of the excellent work that is being undertaken, including new data releases and fascinating new results. Previous presenters in the showcase have talked about the great new data acquisition and geological interpretations. So I'll be focusing on the last three stages of the workflow. If you're interested in more detail on the data acquisition, please see presentations from day two by Laura Gow. And if you're interested in more detail on the geological interpretation work, please see the presentations by Mariord Bonadot, Anthony Schofield, Chris Carson and Marcus Haynes, also from day two of the showcase. Once we have developed an understanding of the fundamental underlying geology, we can ascertain which mineral systems are present or could potentially present given the geological conditions. And the conceptual mineral system models can be developed based on an understanding of the key processes that have shaped, helped shape Australia's geology and concentrated its resources. Geoscience Australia has acquired and continues to acquire large volumes of high quality geoscience data. In order to add value to these pre-competitive data sets, analysis can be undertaken to evaluate their predictive capacity and to help improve understanding of the formation of Australia's mineral systems. For example, this can be done through evaluating relationships between different data sets and known mineral deposits, as well as through reanalysis and interpretation of historic samples. Evaluating the relationship between continental scale data sets and the location of known mineral deposits from different mineral systems is an important step as it allows us to test different hypotheses and the results of the analysis can help guide decisions about which maps to include in mineral potential mapping as well as feature engineering which is how to make the input maps that represent spatial proxies for the mineral systems processes. In the bottom left of this slide, we can see an image showing how the strength of the relationship between conductors in magnetotelluric resistivity models and different mineral systems varies with depth. The results of this work show that a co strong correlation is observed with orogenic gold, which is seen in the warmer colours in the plots. However, weaker correlations are seen for porphyry copper and volcanic hosted massive sulphide mineral systems. The optimal depth can then be determined where the warmer colours are located and then plotted against the distribution of known deposits, for example, in the image in the bottom right. And that can be used for predictive purposes in mineral potential mapping studies. Another example of evaluating these relationships is shown here, where the images show a global map of crustal thickness measurements, as well as the location of known porphyry copper deposits coloured by their total copper endowment. When plotted against each other, as seen in the graph, we don't observe the relationship that we might expect based on previous work, which has suggested that larger deposits are associated with thicker crust. So this result forces us to rethink our understanding of the formation of porphyry copper mineral systems and how to approach mapping their prospectivity. 
For more detailed information on both of these studies, please see the presentation by Marcus Haynes from day two of the showcase. The Heavy Mineral Map of Australia utilises archived National Geochemical Survey of Australia samples, with the darling Kernamona Delamarian release being the first tranche of data to be made publicly available. The 223 samples in this data release are shown on the map in the centre of the slide. The National Heavy Minerals Map will ultimately cover about 80% of Australia and draw on all 1,315 National Geochemical Survey of Australia samples collected from floodplains around the country over a decade ago. The first tranche of data and an accompanying report for the Darling Kernamona Delamarian deep dive area can now be downloaded from the link on the slide. The heavy minerals have been separated by dense liquids, mounted on an epoxy puck, polished and carbon coated. Using energy dispersive X-ray spectrometers and SEM backscatter images, automated mineralogical identification has been generated for about 100,000 grains per mount. The vast amounts of data generated require novel analysis and visualisation methods. This has been achieved through the Mineral Network Analysis Tool, a bespoke cloud-based solution developed at Geoscience Australia, which allows users to visualise and explore the data set, discover heavy mineral associations, and download the data file and mineral vocabulary. The link for the app is shown on the bottom of the slide. Here we can see one of the mineral mount maps on the right of the slide showing identified mineral species coloured differently. Preliminary work has identified garnite, as seen in the map on the left, and zincostorolite in some of the Darling Kernamona Delamarian samples. These minerals are typically associated with metamorphosed base metal mineralisation and represent potential indicator minerals or vectors towards mineralisation. Observations of garnite within this data set correlate positively with known base metal mineral occurrences across South Australia and New South Wales, most notably around the Broken Hill deposit and its mineralised surrounds. This is potentially important, bearing in mind the role that garnite has played in the discovery of the Cannington deposit in northwest Queensland. The results of these analyses are still being interpreted, however represent an exciting new data set that can help inform our understanding of mineral systems and also be integrated into mineral potential mapping studies in order to help reduce the exploration search space. Another geochemistry data release includes data from samples originally collected from 1999 to 2005 in the Kernamona province. This is the first time that this data has been formally released to the public in its entirety. The data and report can now be downloaded from the link on the slide. This data set includes high quality geochemical analyses of 275 groundwater samples and 198 regolith samples. The report includes hydrostratigraphic interpretation of groundwater samples, which is informing new targeted groundwater sampling and baseline work. The data will also be used to define the regional chemical baselines, which enable more sensitive and robust identification of geochemical anomalies. These geochemical anomaly maps can then be generated and utilised within mineral potential mapping studies, again to help reduce our exploration search space. Given all of the data available and the many decades of collective mineral systems expertise, we can start to synthesise all of this into mineral potential mapping studies that allow us to reduce the exploration search space for different mineral systems in Australia. Through evaluating relationships between different data sets and known mineralisation relating to the mineral systems of interest, we can start integrating the vast volumes of data in order to produce mineral potential maps that are both geologically and mathematically robust. The current focus at Geoscience Australia is to build on work undertaken as part of the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative to map the potential for sediment hosted mineral systems across Australia, the United States and Canada. I'll talk more about this initiative in a few more slides. We're currently working on evaluating the potential for sediment hosted base metal mineral systems using both the understanding of these systems at a global scale, but also a specific understanding of these systems within Australia. Future work will involve mapping the mineral potential for iron oxide, copper gold and alkaline rock mineral systems across Australia. Mineral occurrences are an important data set that help us to validate our mineral potential maps as they can provide an indication as to how, how well the maps predict known mineralisation. A compilation of all known mineral occurrences in three deep dive areas across Australia has been undertaken using Geoscience Australia 
and state and territory geological survey databases, as well as extensive literature reviews. The compiled information includes discovery dates and methods, drilling, exploration summaries, follow-up exploration work, as well as the deposit type. The compilation really highlights how many forgotten discoveries and missed opportunities are out there. I'm pleased to announce that the mineral occurrence data sets for each of the three deep dive areas are now available on the Geoscience Australia portal. An extended abstract on this work is also available for download from the Geoscience Australia website. The compilation shows that critical minerals are found in about 10% of occurrences in the Barclay Isa Georgetown deep dive area and also the Darling Kernamona Delamarian area. Whereas the Officer Musgrave deep dive area, about 70% of the occurrences contain critical minerals. Tungsten, antimony, heavy mineral sands and cobalt make up the majority of known critical mineral instances across the three deep dive areas. All three regions are rich in cobalt. Barclay Isa Georgetown and Darling Kernamona Delamarian are rich in tungsten. The Murray Basin within the Darling Kernamona Delamarian deep dive area is rich in heavy mineral sands, and the Barclay Isa Georgetown region is rich in antimony. In addition to understanding the distribution of some of the smaller mineral occurrences, it is also important to compile information on the larger, more economic mineral deposits. So in addition to the mineral occurrence compilation, a comprehensive compilation of information on over 900 important Australian mineral deposits has been undertaken. The information includes, but isn't limited to, information on deposit classification or mineral system using the new deposit classification scheme of Hofstra et al, which was undertaken as part of the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative, which I'll talk about further in a couple of slides as well as the age of the deposits, metal endowment, and information on lithology, host rock, and alteration. This new compilation of major Australia mineral deposits provides new insights into spatial and temporal relationships that can help guide our understanding of mineral systems and can also be used in conjunction with the mineral occurrences to validate our mineral potential mapping outputs. Although preference is to use deposits rather than occurrences because we're trying to target the more economic mineral systems. Another mineral deposit compilation has been undertaken for global zinc lead deposits. This data set provides information on their name and location, deposit type and or mineral system. This information has again been assigned using the Hofstra et al deposit classification scheme. Uh, the age of the deposits, metal endowment, as well as host rock alteration and mineralogy. This compilation allows the understanding of Australian mineral deposits in a global context and can provide useful insights into the formation of different zinc lead mineral systems and which spatial proxies might be useful to help map these mineral systems processes as part of any subsequent mineral potential mapping studies undertaken. The Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative is a collaboration between Geoscience Australia, the United States Geological Survey and the Geological Survey of Canada. As part of this initiative, continental scale mineral potential maps for clastic dominated zinc lead and Mississippi Valley type mineral systems were generated using both statistical and machine learning based approaches. These systems are known to have potential for critical minerals as a byproduct or co-product, including germanium and cadmium. The results of this mineral potential mapping work are available for download as both a journal paper and an accompanying data set, which are freely available as an open access publication from the link on the slide. It is also important to note here that this mineral potential mapping work included analysis of the relationship between individual input maps and known mineral deposits. This helped to guide decisions around which maps to include as spatial proxies for different mineral systems processes, as well as the parameters that should be used to make the input maps in the first place. Once we've produced mineral potential maps that evaluate the geological potential of an area, it's then important to understand the economic viability of a project in that area. The Economic Fairways Mapper combines large scale infrastructure and geological data sets to evaluate the mining, processing, administrative and infrastructure expenses of mining operations across Australia with a spatial context. All of these factors are combined to provide a rapid high level spatial estimate of economic viability or potential that allows economic considerations to be evaluated much earlier into the initial stages of mineral exploration. The results from the Economic Fairways Mapper can then be integrated with our other tools to guide exploration 
to essentially provide an assessment of the geological potential within the constraints of economic feasibility. I'll now show a brief video of the Economic Fairways Mapper tool in action. The video is sped up to about one and a half times so that you can see how quick it is to set up and run a model. The tool can be accessed from the Geoscience Australia portal and then by clicking on the tools option towards the top right and scrolling down to find the Economic Fairways Mapper. You can then go through and select your preferred parameters. I'm just using the default values for nickel in this video. However, as you saw on the previous slide, there are other options available and currently under development. The tool allows the user to select their preferred method of analysis, cover model, or body geometry and grade, as well as economic parameters and a preferred output model. The results can then be downloaded in a variety of formats and compared with the results of mineral potential mapping or other exploration targeting data that can help guide decisions around the possible economic viability of a project. The National Mine Waste Assessment Project is being undertaken in a collaboration with a number of organisations. This project is about understanding the potential for secondary prospectivity for critical minerals through the analysis of mine waste, as well as integrated economic modelling to support the extraction and management of reprocessed mine waste. The graph on the slide shows the distribution of trace elements in iron oxide copper gold deposits at Olympic Dam and Ernest Henry. We can see that along with the expected high values of copper and gold, given that they are iron oxide copper gold deposits, we also observe that there's anomalous concentrations of critical minerals, including some rare earth elements. This suggests that mine waste from these types of deposit may represent an unrealised opportunity as a resource for different critical minerals. Evaluating Australia's mineral potential is dependent on the acquisition of high quality data that can be interpreted to produce new pre-competitive geoscience data sets such as new solid geology maps. These data sets then allow us to analyse the spatial and temporal relationships that allow us to better understand the processes that led to the formation of different mineral systems and how they can be targeted through the integration of the large volumes of data with the mineral systems understanding to produce mineral potential maps. Although the geological potential for the formation of a mineral deposit is critical, so too is the economic viability of the development of that resource as a mine. The Economic Fairways Mapper allows for a first-pass spatial assessment of the economic viability of a project at early stages of the exploration process. It has also become apparent that understanding the secondary prospectivity and economic viability of reprocessing old mine waste is important for moving towards a low carbon economy. So stay tuned for the results of this work in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ariane, for highlighting all those opportunities. Our next speaker, Dr. Alex Kalinowski, will highlight how we are assessing Australia's opportunity for CO2 enhanced oil recovery applied to residual oil zones. Alex is the Assistant Director for the Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice Directorate and leads the Residual Oil Zone module for the Exploring for the Future program. Alex holds a Bachelor of Science with Honours in Geology from the Australian National University and a PhD in Geology from the University of New South Wales. She has worked extensively on carbon capture, utilisation and storage in her 20 years at Geoscience Australia, most recently focusing on geological storage combined with utilisation of CO2 for enhanced oil production. Hello and thanks for joining in today. I'm going to tell you a bit about our work on CO2 enhanced oil recovery and residual oil zones in Australia. Residual oil zones are reservoirs that contain mainly water and also a component of immobile oil that can be produced through CO2 enhanced oil recovery. And our challenge in this project is to see if we can identify the residual oil zones in Australia and then determine the magnitude of the CO2 storage and oil resources that are possibly available. And I'd like to emphasise that this is a collaborative project with a team comprising colleagues at CSIRO, expert technical consultants, and I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our industry, state and territory government and other contributors to this project. We have two key drivers for this project. The first is greenhouse gas abatement. Carbon capture and storage is one of the technologies that can help achieve net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. And as you can see on this map, we have several operating or advanced CCS projects around the country 
um, and there are many more in various stages of development. While we've done a lot of work to identify suitable saline aquifers and depleted fields for CO2 storage, um, we're always looking to uh, supplement those storage resources with other opportunities. The second driver is domestic energy security and liquid hydrocarbon supply for non-energy uses, such as manufacturing some products and materials. Uh, on the map here, you can see Australia's cumulative oil production to 2020 in the light green, with the darker greens representing reserves and resources that are remaining. Australia is increasingly relying on importing more oil and refined petroleum products, and we're depleting our producing fields faster than we can replace them. With the right conditions, CO2 enhanced oil recovery can actually address both of these challenges by potentially producing carbon neutral or even carbon negative oil, maximising the use of our oil resources and also helping to accelerate the deployment of CCS by providing some financial return on these projects. CO2 EOR is a proven technology that has been used successfully since the 1970s to improve the yield of oil and to extend the life of oil fields. Uh, usually around 40% of the oil in place in, can be produced through primary production. And then secondary production with water flooding can sweep out another 10 to 20% of that oil. This leaves a significant amount of oil in the reservoir. And CO2 enhanced oil recovery can recover an additional 10 to 20% of that oil. In this process, and you can see in this diagram, CO2 is injected into the reservoir where it mixes with the remaining immobile oil and acts like a solvent, making it easier for that oil to flow through to the producing wells. At the producer wells, the two phases are separated and that CO2 is recycled for ongoing ER, OR activities. Importantly, each time this happens, some of that injected CO2 remains in the reservoir and this process can result in a large amount of CO2 stored. A couple of years ago, we completed a CO2 CRC study to find out more about the potential to develop a CO2 EOR industry in Australia. We screened oil producing basins using a range of geological and oil properties. And we also took into account practical and economic factors, such as the availability of CO2 and CO2 infrastructure. And we found that there's actually really good potential for CO2 EOR in many of our basins. Of course, the amount of CO2 stored through CO2 EOR uh, depends very much on the goals of a given project. For example, if your goal is to achieve maximum oil production with minimum use of CO2, um, then of course you want to use less CO2 and you don't want to store it. If, on the other hand, your goal is to produce carbon neutral or even negative oil, then you want to increase the amount of CO2 that you're actually using to produce each barrel of oil. Most of the CO2 EOR projects worldwide store between about 0.3 and 0.9 um, tonnes of CO2 per barrel of oil produced. So, for example, producing 20 million barrels of oil might store between 6 and 18 million tonnes of CO2. So to achieve carbon neutrality or better, um, you need to be storing more than about half a tonne of CO2 per barrel of oil produced. And we found that looking around the projects worldwide, that's actually definitely achievable. So this got us thinking about where else CO2 EOR could be used, um, particularly with a view to accelerating the deployment of CCS. And we started looking into residual oil zones. Residual oil zones, as I mentioned previously, are naturally water flooded reservoirs that contain some immobile oil that can be produced with CO2 EOR. And they can contain significant amounts of oil um, and also store very large volumes of CO2. So these things occur beneath conventional oil fields in a brownfield scenario that you can see on the right here. And they can also occur without a main pay zone, and that's the greenfield scenario that you can see here. Uh, in the Permian Basin in the United States, um, commercial quantities of oil are actually being produced from both brownfields and greenfields residual oil zones using CO2 EOR. There are a few different ways that these geological residual oil zones can form, and I won't dwell on this except to note that by understanding how rosas might form in a particular region, that helps us target where we might find them and where we should look. So, for example, um, the hydrodynamic drive method, where flow of water actually flushes through and displaces oil in a trap, is a common mechanism for the formation of major North American residual oil zones, but hasn't really been documented in Australia. We tend to see um, residual oil zones formed through tectonic tilting, leakage, um, from a breached trap 
and also thick transition zone types of occurrences. So what we've done is we've developed a workflow to identify potential residual oil zones in Australia. And we've then applied it to fields in the Cooper Basin um, and this also in the simpson Padurka, Amadeus, Bowen and Surratt Basins. And I'll show you what that looks like using the example of the Cooper Basin. So beginning with all of the hydrocarbon fields in an area, we selected or rejected candidates for further analysis using knowledge of the area's petroleum systems, geology, and also considering data availability. This included disqualifying fields that, for example, um, contain only gas or are too shallow or are too tight. The remaining fields were then prioritised based on uh, factors such as their oil in place, their production history, and any reported residual oil zones. The next step was to complete a geological screening to identify fields with high residual oil zone potential based on the nature of the oil pay zones, shows in the field, um, and other factors. And we ended up with around 100 candidate fields that were put forward to the next stage, which is petrophysical analysis. Petrophysical analysis included looking for qualitative indications of residual oil zones, followed by quantitative calculation of the oil saturation using resistivity logs. Resistivity based methods are the main way that we can determine oil saturation and are based on the fact that saline formation water conducts electricity, whereas both oil and the majority of rock grains don't. So zones that have oil show a higher resistivity than just water saturated rocks. And you can see in the example that we have here that the more green in the hydrocarbon column indicates a higher oil saturation. Um, for the petrophysicists out there, for the clean sandstones and limestone reservoirs filled with saline water, we used classical Archie analysis for computing that oil saturation. Um, and because some clays can also act as a conductive element in the rock, where we have a high clay content, we used a Shaley sand model, which is just a modified version of the Archie analysis. So the next step was to look at where we had plausible residual oil zones determined from petrophysics um, to actually match that interpretation with evidence from, of oil in, in the well. So we looked at shows and formation tests and also fluid inclusions in geochemistry where you had those available. And you can see here that we've used Geoscience Australia's shows classification scheme, um, which you can see above this lovely image of fluorescing core that uh, indicates the presence of oil. Finally, we ended up with assessments for around 70 fields. Um, and on the map here, you can see that confirmed residual oil zones are actually represented by the green stars. And the other fields that we looked at are designated as plausible or possible or unlikely, or we've noted where we have no evidence of a residual oil zone. And some of these are actually worth further investigation as well. And what I'll do now is I'll show you some examples of what these interpretations look like at the locations that are marked in red. So the first example we have is from the Dolangari field. And this is one of the larger fields that we looked at with oil in place of some 50 million barrels. Um, there's a lot of information here. So just focus on the columns that I've highlighted, which are the resistivity, shows, and hydrocarbon saturation columns. And so what we have here is a confirmed residual oil zone that can be seen in multiple wells across this field with a calculated oil saturation of between 15 and 30%, which is about what you'd expect. Um, and supporting evidence from shows and formation tests is also included in this interpretation in that shows column. And if you look at it in a little bit more detail, what we can see is that we have production from the main pay zones in the Namur and McKinley formations. And you can see that there are um, high oil saturations and correspondingly strong shows of oil. The oil saturation then reduces and the shows become weaker as you enter the transition zone beneath that main pay zone. And then finally, the ROS is defined below the transition zone with weaker but still present shows. Another confirmed example of a residual oil zone can be seen in Boilan 1, which is a smaller field with just a few million barrels of oil in place. Uh, the main pay zone has an oil saturation of about 60% based on the Shaley sand analysis. And um, the, the petrophysical analysis here is really supported very well by oil shows. Uh, the other thing you can note is that we have done 
both the Archie and Shaley Sand analysis, and they are very um, much in agreement in this case. Below this, we have a transition zone with a reduced oil saturation of between about 20 and 50 percent. And finally, we have a pretty well-defined residual oil zone with a calculated oil saturation of about 10 to 20 percent, um, again, supported well by oil shows. We don't always get a positive or straightforward result, of course. Sometimes we don't see any evidence of a residual oil zone below the main pay zone at all, and sometimes the petrophysics and uh, shows don't align, and quite often we get false positives. This example from Chuku One shows a false positive, where the petrophysical interpretation suggests that there's a possible greenfield residual oil zone in the Namur sandstone between uh, sporadic oil that's detected in the adjacent shaley formations. However, we have no oil column present above the residual oil indications. We have a very flat resistivity log motif. There's no evidence from oil shows to substantiate the petrophysical interpretation. And the nearby wells are clearly water wet throughout the same interval. Interestingly though, we do have a confirmed residual oil zone in this well in the Hutton sandstone. So we'll be releasing our data and reports on the identification of residual oil zones soon. And in the meantime, we're moving ahead with other parts of our project. So one of our goals is to answer questions around how efficiently the oil can be extracted using EOR and how much CO2 can actually be stored in that reservoir. And we're approaching this through an experimental and reservoir modeling program of work that includes uh, what you can see here, advanced core flooding experiments, conceptual reservoir modeling, PVT analysis and compositional uh, simulations all of which will help us to build predictive tools around oil production and CO2 storage efficiency in residual oil zones under various conditions. We're not just looking at geological factors though. Part of our work is focusing on the economics of CCUS. You may be familiar with the very successful high potential economic fairways that we have developed for mineral resources and hydrogen production and we're now working with Monash University to extend that modelling to CCUS. As an example, here you can see a preliminary model of the storage and transport cost given four storage sites that are shown on the right um, using a least cost distance from any point to the nearest sequestration location. And the main thing to note is that the lighter colours represent lower costs. And I'll finish by giving you a glimpse of the new CCUS portal and multi-criteria decision support tool that we're developing and implementing as part of GA's data portal. This portal will provide access to all of our work, CCUS data sets and information, and tools such as pipeline route design and the economic modeling component that I showed you just, before, just on the previous slide. And the aim here is to help a variety of stakeholders and investors plan CCUS projects, hubs and infrastructure and to identify opportunities for integration and efficient use of resources with respect to CCS, um, with a few ideas that are listed here on the right of how we might do that. We're always interested in receiving feedback and having further uh, discussions around our work. Please have a look at some of the resources that we have available. Please get in touch and thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex, for that insightful talk. Our last speaker in this session is Dr. Andrew Fites on the hot topic of hydrogen and green steel. Andrew is the director of the Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice section and leads the hydrogen module for the Exploring for the Future program. He holds a bachelor degree with honours in environmental engineering from the University of Queensland and a PhD in environmental engineering from the University of New South Wales. Andrew joined Geoscience Australia in 2008 after a career as an academic researcher in water treatment technologies. His research interests include geological storage of CO2, the measurement of greenhouse gas leaks and seeps, geothermal and underground hydrogen storage. Hi, my name is Andrew Feitz and I'm the Director for Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice at Geoscience Australia. Um, it is my pleasure to share with you the hydrogen work that geoscience is undertaking through the Exploring for the Future program. This work is supporting the establishment of the hydrogen industry in Australia. While it might not immediately spring to mind, 
Geoscience is playing an important planning role in the establishment of the hydrogen industry. Under EFTF, we have a number of areas of hydrogen research to support this planning. Geospatial economic analysis through our hydrogen economic fairways tool, better mapping of underground salt resources and looking for new ones. Salt is key for large scale underground hydrogen storage. We are also interested in natural or geologic hydrogen, a potentially cheaper source of hydrogen that could supplement manufactured hydrogen. This is a very new and interesting area of research and little is known about the extent of this resource. I don't have a lot of results to share at this stage about natural hydrogen, but we have an extensive field program planned for 2022, 2023. That's for next year's showcase. Finally, green steel. With lots of iron ore and good hydrogen potential, green steel is the next logical step. I will provide some initial analysis of this later in the talk. Firstly, why are we interested in hydrogen? Well, hydrogen provides a pathway for deep decarbonisation of the global economy. Electrification can get you so far, but for really tricky sectors, that's where hydrogen comes in. The first area of focus is the transportation sector, especially heavy vehicles such as trucks, trains and ships, basically anything that uses diesel or fuel oil. Batteries are okay for short distances, but for long haul transport, a tank of hydrogen is much lighter than a massive battery. Next on the list is blending hydrogen into the national gas distribution network, starting at 10% and then ultimately moving to 100% hydrogen. This has already started in Aubrey, New South Wales. At 10%, nothing needs to be changed. The steel piping, the appliances, nothing. 100% hydrogen gas network would also enable firming of the electricity grid by providing backup power just like natural gas does today. Next is decarbonisation of heavy industry. Replacing coal with hydrogen for the manufacture of steel, using renewable sourced hydrogen rather than natural gas for the production of ammonia and fertilisers and many more. The Yarra Pilbara ammonia plant in this photo produces 5% of the world's ammonia. They are currently building a demo plant to replace um, hydrogen from natural gas with hydrogen from renewable energy. Many other plants around the world are doing this also. Finally, exports. With extensive natural resources, plenty of land for wind and solar, Australia is aiming to be a top three exporter of hydrogen to the Asia market and become a global superpower in clean energy exports. There are some pretty big projects planned for Australia and I'll talk about these more later in the talk. The work presented here today is part of Geoscience Australia's commitment to support the implementation of the National Hydrogen Strategy. Consistent with the strategy, we consider hydrogen made from renewable energy using electrolysis and hydrogen from fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. These different approaches require different natural resources and our work helps identify the optimal location for hydrogen hubs and projects. Our hydrogen economic fairways tool, HEFT, does exactly that. Released in 2021, HEFT is built within the framework of Monash University's blue cap code and provides a coupled geospatial economic analysis. This code was originally developed as a mineral prospectivity tool, but it was clear that the same approach could be applied to hydrogen developments, linking infrastructure with resources. It considers factors like the capital and operating costs of a hydrogen plant, distance to port and to water resources, and the renewable energy generation capacity at different locations and for different sized plants across Australia. The overall goal is to generate a map of net present value of hydrogen production at any location across Australia for a selected target hydrogen price. We released an updated version in 2022 that now includes a break-even analysis and underground hydrogen storage. Version three is not far away. Um, and it will include export products such as ammonia and liquid hydrogen and customizable operating and capital cost sliders for hydrogen production. This was based on feedback from industry. So keep your eyes peeled for news of an update over the coming months. We can add more data to the heft analysis to build up a rich picture for this new industry and where new infrastructure is required. The underlying map is a scenario from heft for a hybrid wind and solar production scenario and sending hydrogen to export. 
red areas are profitable, blue areas are unprofitable, and white is the break-even analysis for this example. What's very encouraging is that the announced hydrogen projects are mostly appearing in our red areas, suggesting that our model is not too bad. Once you start adding electricity transmission lines and gas pipelines, you can start to see where there are infrastructure gaps. Also shown on this map are known thick salt locations around Australia in green, and the location of depleted gas fields. This brings us to the next topic of this talk, underground hydrogen storage. A major area of research under EFTF is underground hydrogen storage. We are looking at underground salt accumulations, which can be used to produce salt caverns, but also looking at the feasibility of using depleted gas fields for hydrogen storage. We are just wrapping up a major project with CO2 CRC and Schlumberger, looking at the geomechanical effects of hydrogen storage in a depleted gas field compared to other gases, making sure that the hydrogen storage is safe and doesn't cause fractures um, in the storage rock. However, salt storage is our main focus. You may ask, why are we focusing on underground hydrogen storage? Underground storage is much cheaper for large-scale storage of hydrogen than in other forms, such as liquid ammonia or liquid hydrogen. It is also much cheaper than hydrogen storage as metal hydrides or equivalent battery storage. Bloomberg New Energy Finance estimate that the world's first large-scale battery at Hornsdale in South Australia stores the equivalent to only 3.3 tonnes of hydrogen. Depleted gas fields, if found suitable, could store very large quantities of hydrogen to support seasonal demand. Salt cavern storage, based on most reports, is relatively cheap, primarily because it is more flexible and the hydrogen can be cycled through at more times over a given period than depleted gas fields. Gas cleanup, if required, is also less likely to be an issue. So the search is on for salt. Australia has many sedimentary basins that contain salt, but thick salt accumulations, particularly halite, have been intersected by wells in only a few basins, namely the Canning, the Amadeus, the Adavale, and the Polder basins. The photo is an example of the type of salt we're looking for. Found within the core archives of the Queensland Government's core store, it's a core sample of the Boree salt from the Adavale basin, and in places is over half a kilometre thick. As you can see in the map, the Boree salt is the only known thick salt accumulation in Eastern Australia, and is therefore a very strategic resource. Getting a better handle on the size and extent of this resource has been a priority for us. Mapping of the Adavale Basin hasn't really progressed much since 1980, and even that was largely based on 1967 analysis. In collaboration with Intrepid Geophysics and the Queensland Geological Survey, we have built a preliminary 3D model of the Adavale Basin, with a particular focus on the Boree salt. We have mapped three salt bodies, and I would refer you to the extended abstract released as part of this showcase for more details. Given the lack of wells and good seismic in this area, there are still many unknowns, and there's a real need to acquire more data to better map this important salt resource. Another area of interest is the Polder Basin in South Australia. We have mapped the salt resource in the offshore Polder Basin and undertaken it an initial design of a salt cavern. The offshore Polder Basin contains an excellent salt resource, approximately one kilometre thick of almost pure halite. The salt depth is good and is located only 60 kilometres offshore and within reasonable proximity to the Eyre Peninsula, which is scoped to be a major hydrogen hub. Offshore salt storage hasn't really been considered in Australia to date, but is under active consideration in Europe and the UK. This is potentially a very good option for this part of Australia. A single large salt cavern could provide the same amount of energy as Snowy Hydro 2.0. You don't need a lot of salt caverns to provide significant energy storage and help to help firm periods of low renewable energy output, as we have experienced in Australia recently. What about onshore? Well, the Polder Basin is a thin, skinny basin, and the same formation which contains the salt in the offshore extends to the onshore, admittedly with a whopping big geological fault in between. While there is good seismic coverage in the offshore, shown by all the lines in this figure, there is relatively little seismic coverage in the onshore. The number of onshore wells is also limited, and only one of these wells, Kilroo 1A, is deep enough to intersect the salt hosting Kilroo formation 
and it's located on the far eastern margin of the basin. So whether salt is present or not in the onshore polder basin is presently unknown. We are planning a gravity survey this financial year to see if we can provide evidence of salt and inspire further data collection in this potentially strategic area. Discovery of a thick salt accumulation in the onshore polder basin would be a massive boon for the hydrogen industry in South Australia. Now let's move to the Canning Basin in Western Australia. The Canning Basin is known to contain thick, extensive salt beds, but much of it is quite deep. A good option is to look for salt dike piers, where columns of salt have migrated towards the surface. We have used some of the fabulous airborne electromagnetic data, or AEM data, collected under EFTF and shown by Laura earlier in this session, to look for shallow salt leads. AEM can only resolve the top five, 600 metres, but this might be okay to look for disrupted zones above salt dye piers, as seen here at the Frome Rocks dye pier, the only known salt dye pier in this region. Working with the University of Queensland, we have identified some leads that are worth further investigation. And again, I would refer you to the extended abstract for more details. The final basin we are looking at today is the Officer Basin. This large inland basin is known to contain salt, but wells to date have only intersected tens of metres of salt, not the hundreds of metres that are required. The seismic line collected by Geoscience Australia back in 2011 highlights the issue. We can see what seem to be large salt structures highlighted in green, but all the wells to date have missed them. Salt hasn't really been considered a strategic resource um, in the past, and so it hasn't been a target of drilling. We have started the process of mapping salt leads in yellow in the Officer Basin and Arkaringa Basin based on the available seismic. There appear to be lots of salt structures, but they do need to be drilled to be proven up. This map also highlights large parts of the Officer Basin is without seismic or wells, and we have no idea whether salt accumulations are present there or not. As part of EFTF, we will be applying the AEM prospecting technique that we tested in the Canning Basin to the Officer Basin to identify potential new salt leads in areas without seismic coverage. The new AEM surveys, as you can see in this figure, are extensive and will cover most of the Officer Basin. You may ask why the interest in the Officer Basin isn't a long way away. Well, not really. There is a very large 50 gigawatt renewable hydrogen project planned on the Nullarbor Plain on the very southernmost border of Western Australia and South Australia. At this location, the wind resource is good, the solar resource is not too bad, meaning you get a high hybrid wind and solar capacity factor. A salt discovery in the southern Officer Basin, clearly not one in a national park, could conceivably support storage needs for hydrogen projects along this part of Australia. With good hydrogen production potential, salt storage and iron ore resources, Australia has the ingredients for green steel. This map shows the best areas for solar, wind and hybrid wind and solar hydrogen production. Also shown are thick salt resources and iron ore reserves, both hematite and magnetite. The vast majority of our exported iron is as hematite but studies suggest that magnetite may be more suited for domestic green iron making and steel making. This is because magnetite is magnetic and easier to separate and concentrate. The distinction between iron making and steel making is important. Iron making is the step before steel making and is a very energy intensive process with high carbon emissions. Many of the countries where we export our iron ore to have well established steel making industries which they are unlikely to want to shut down. If we export green iron rather than green steel, this may prove a win-win for Australia and our trading partners. If we do go all the way to green steel, our preliminary studies suggest a good mix of wind and solar is ideal, with little difference for standalone production systems between WA's Pilbara and South Australia's Eyre Peninsula. However, if South Australia is able to supplement grid based electricity and take advantage of low or even negative energy prices, this is projected to substantially reduce the cost of green steel production. Regardless, the cost of green steel is projected to fall as the cost of hydrogen and the cost of renewable energy decreases in the future. 
carbon tariffs, such as the European Union's carbon border adjustment mechanism, will make green steel increasingly competitive in the future. Together with Monash University, we have produced a nice extended abstract on this work, which I would encourage you to read. Well, that's a brief summary of our work over the last 12 months. There are a few things I didn't get time to mention. This includes our geothermal hydrogen review with the University of Melbourne, a natural hydrogen from iron minerals review with the University of New South Wales, and salt dating work with Curtin University and the Geological Survey of Western Australia. Keep an eye out on the EFTF website for product releases associated with this work. There is an ambitious work program ahead, including further heft upgrades, building on the preliminary green steel work, further salt studies and release of an updated salt map, more geomechanical studies, and an ambitious geological hydrogen field campaign. I look forward to sharing these results with you next time. Finally, a big thank you to the 2021-2022 hydrogen team and our collaborators, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Andrew. It's fascinating to hear about where the hydrogen economy is going next. This brings us to our question and answer session for the resource potential theme.